Hannah. Uh, let, I'm just um, to share my screen. So you, you'll see from this first slide, I've reproduced the, the icon for this talk, which really has three uh, elements to it. So in the background, you can see some equations. You don't need to worry too much about those. And uh, in the foregrounds, uh, foregrounds on um, two paintings, one of a zooplankton species, Calnus finmarchicus, uh, and of a fish, uh, which is uh, Benthosema glaciale. And I'll have a lot to say about those species um, during the course of this talk. But to, to, to kick things off before we really get underway with the talk, I'd like to start with a, a little poll about you and your interests. So I want to ask here, what are your interests? Are you mainly interested in ecological modeling or mainly interested in zooplankton or mainly interested in fish or alternatively just general interest? So we'll give everyone just a few more seconds to vote. Don't worry, it is entirely anonymous. So we're not going to call out anyone if you're selecting a specific option. Shall we move on? Yep, so uh, the majority of our audience, 55%, are interested in Ecological, Ecological modeling. Ecological modeling. Not so much on zooplankton, um, but on fish and, and, a, and a fair bit in general interest. Well, I hope I'll be able to uh, address the interests of, of uh, um, uh, most of the, the audience at any rate. The balance in this talk will be a bit more on the zooplankton than the fish, um, but they, they, they both share elements of, of, uh, uh, of the, the techniques of ecological modeling for spatial systems. So I want to start the main part of the talk then with, with uh, something about zooplankton. Um, and I guess given the, the, the response to the poll uh, there that, that this species that I'm going to talk on, Calnus finmarchicus, will not be familiar to you. But it is an extremely abundant species in the North Atlantic. Um, and there's a wide, a very wide distribution. So if you look at the, the figure on the left there, that's data from a device known as the Continuous Plankton Recorder, which is uh, something that's, that's towed behind ships of opportunity at a depth of about 10 metres and, uh, uh, and is used to, to, to gain a picture of what's happening to, to, to plankton, plankton species um, in space and time. What we've got here are um, an aggregate of uh, lots of data um, giving the, 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 the mean number of, uh, in the surface waters for uh, adult Calnus finmarchicus. And you can see that it's, that it's got extremely wide distribution. Lots in the Labrador Sea, the Ermager Sea in the left there, extending uh, right up into the, into the Norwegian Sea. And, and the North Sea indeed. Um, so the species has quite a complicated life cycle. So the middle panel shows you, shows you the life cycle. It starts off life as eggs and then goes through a series of molts called, uh, and these are the noplier stages at first, labeled here, N1, N2, N3, N4, N5, N6. So we've got a lot, lot, of, lot of stages. Uh, and then there's a major change in the, in, in the development, the changes into capepidite stages. And again, there are six of those. But another feature of the life cycle is you can see at the top left of that diagram, you've got C5D. So what's happening there before the pre-adult, the pre-adult stage C5 can enter a, a torpid state in the winter where they sink down below the, like the kraken below the thunders of the upper deep. And they sink down to, to many hundreds of metres, even thousands of metres in depth, uh, where, they're, where they, they go into a state called diapause and will overwinter in that state before popping back up to the surface uh, and, and molting into adults and starting their life cycle over again. The, the photo on the, on the right shows you uh, what, they, what they look like 
uh, in about two millimetres long as, as adults. So, of course, this, the, it's a widespread species. It's eaten by a lot of, of, uh, of fish as prey. So it's an important component of the marine ecosystem in the North Atlantic. And, and as I say, extremely abundant. Some, in some cases, it's 80% of the zooplankton biomass. But modelling, it's going to pre present lots of challenges. First of all, we, we need something that, that, that covers the life cycle. So we need a physiologically structured uh, model to deal with this. And, and, and clearly it's over a large area. So we need something that's split, spatially explicit. So we're having to model advection and diffusion on ocean basin scales. And clearly to do that in a way that's usable so that we can, we can explore um, model variants and do experiments with the models, we need exceptional computational efficiency. So our approach uh, uh, in the Strathclyde Marine Modeling Group uh, is something that we've come to, to, to label the Strathcal model. So the model is computationally efficient, it's discrete in time and it's discrete in space. So the, the, in space, the, the, the population is divided up into a grid of horizontal cells. And we simplify the problem in 3D by, by collapsing the vertical into two layers. So there's a surface layer where, the, where, where most of the, the biological activity is occurring. And then that's, that's the top 100 meters. And then there's a deep layer to represent what's happening with the, uh, the diapausing C5s. And we calculate the probability of moving between cells by what's called Lagrangian particle tracking, um, which is driven by some other model of the, of the circulation. And in, in this case, the results I will be talking about will be, there, or it's, this is with NEMO, a model known as NEMO, which is run um, by the, the uh, National Oceanographic Centre in, in, in Southampton. So Lagrangian particle tracking means that we're, we're setting off a number of discrete particles at a particular location and then using the outputs of the physical model to generate the, to, to generate the vectors of, uh, of the change in position. So we, part, we, we, we set off say 100, 100 particles in each of our, our grid cells and then track these over, over some time step and and store the results. We store the probability of a particles that started in a given uh, cell, uh, uh, the probability that they end up in, in another cell. So the scientific challenge, I'll say a bit more about the bio, how we model biology in a minute. The scientific challenge here um, is that the range of Calmus finmarchicus has been changing in time. In the Arctic in particular, uh, there's very rapid uh, climate change effects that, that are thought to co will, will cause changes in the northern extent of, of this species and therefore uh, impacts on, on the, the, the ecosystems there. Another related uh, question is that the overwintering C5s so that's the diapausing individuals store energy as lipids. So that's, that's their energy store, um, which they use to, to survive over the, the winter. But a consequence of this is that the vertical migration causes a large transfer of the surface production. So they feed on, they feed on, on, on uh, phytoplankton. So they're, they're capturing this production in the surface and bringing it to the uh, in, into to, uh, deep, deep water. So this, this process is known as the lipid pump. And it's been shown uh, recently by Sigrun Jonas' daughter and, and, other, and, and her co-workers that the amount of carbon can be very substantial. So the amount of carbon that's sequestered uh, by these overwintering calmness is about the same as the annual sink, sinking rate of, uh, of detrital carbon. So it's a, it's a very significant source of the transfer of production in the surface to, to deep waters and thus far has not been included in global ecosystem models. Does it? So we're, we're interested then in two scientific questions. What's the poleward expansion of Calus van Marchicus in the Atlantic and what's the magnitude of any changes uh, uh, on, 
and how they the they affect the, lip, the lipid pump. The um, the photo on the the right there is uh, one of diposing Calanus finmarchicus, and you can see the structure in the centre. So you can see the antennae, that's the head end, and the structure right down the centre. There's the lipid sac. So it takes up when they're in diapause, it takes up a large proportion of their, their body volume. I'm not gonna pepper the talk with, with a great deal of equations, but, I'm, but this, I'll, I'll put in a little bit of cer ceremonial mathematics as it were. So for the biological development, how we approach this is that we divide up the, uh, the, life, the, the, the life stage from eggs up to adults by a set of discrete classes. So we then grow locally at a given grid cell, we grow the population along these, these development classes by computing the integral that's in, in, indicated here. So delta Q in this equation is the width of a development class. So we want to integrate the growth rate such that, that we uh, achieve growth that spans one, one class width. So that so that's amount to, amounts to solving this equation with an unknown upper bound to the integral. And uh, the growth rate depends on the environment, so in space, temperature, and, and food. And then for the, the, the movement between spatial cells, we're just adding up uh, all the, 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 the class abundances before an update, distributing them uh, over, over all the destination cells, uh, and then the, the uh, redistrib so they are redistributed over over all the de the, the, the destinations and um, the, the the this is done the probability of moving from cell to cell as I, as I said earlier was is achieved by the Lagrangian particle tracking which is stored offline from the main model um, in, a, in a transfer matrix. So schematically, you can think of the, the Strathcal model biology um, with this, this diagram. So on, on the surface, we have all the eggs, the nuclear stages, the capepidites, uh, and the, the adults. But the C5 stage possibly can enter diapause and move from the surface waters to the deep, and we have development of the diapausing individuals, when they reach the end of their diapause, they emerge and join the adult class. So for each group, we are assuming uniform physiological age for each group of the stages. And the development rate, in other words, how fast we're moving along uh, these, these arrows, is a function of temperature and food availability. Food availability is uh, phytoplankton abundance, which can be from satellite observations, ocean color observations, or from the outputs of global ecosystem models. Also, uh, key biological assumptions in the model. We're, we know from data that the, the prosome length, so that's the that's a, a measure of the of the organism size, is a, a linear negative uh, relationship with the temperature at birth. So in the model, we assume that the the, the individuals are born at a specific uh, size that's determined by their temperature. And that governs the size of organism that they will, the size of adult that they will grow into. The development rate at which they grow from eggs to, to adults depends on temperature, but we, we model it in a way that's slightly different from, from previous people that have considered uh, models of, of Calnus finmarchicus, in that we take uh, data from experiments, we know that, feed, that the feeding rate depends on, on temperature, and we know that the metabolic costs go up with temperature. So if you combine those two, the result is this U-shaped function uh, shown in panel B here that gives the development time from egg to adult as a function of temperature. You can see that the data points indicated by the, 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 the dots there 
uh, are just on the left-hand part of that curve, and typically they go down. So the, the, the individuals are growing faster at higher temperatures. But our models also predicting, although this tends not to be observed, a rather steep increase in development time if temperature continues to increase because uh, the, 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 the costs in also increase, the growth costs, the metabolic costs increase with temperature. Fecundity is also uh, a function of food and temperature. So panel C shows you the egg production rates, eggs per female per day with data and our fitted model with this humped um, shape for the, for the fecundity as a function of temperature. Finally, panel D is a critical one here. So the, because the prosome length depends on temperature, so the adult organism uh, is smaller if it's born in, in an environment that's, that's warm, and if it's cool, it gets to be a larger organism. The organism size determines how big the lipid sac is, and that affects how long they can, they can sustain diapause when they're not feeding, they're in the deep water, and um, uh, they're, 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 there's no food around, so they're just living off the lipid reserve. So combining all of these, we can, we can, we can produce a plot like the, the panel D here. So temper, temperature at birth depend, affects the prosome length. So that's the y-axis here on the left and the right of the panel. So we can map temperature at birth to prosome length. And the dipause temperature, so that's the, the temperature in the deep water where they're overwintering, determines how fast they use up their lipid reserve. So there is the, the, the balance between these then gives you a potential diapause duration, which are the contour lines here. So the numbers are the days of, of, the, the, uh, of the duration of diapause. So it's a function of, of the temperature of the diapause environment, deep temperature, and the temperature at which they were born, because that depends how big, that affects how big they are and how, and how much lipid they can carry down to the, to the diaposing deep water. So this, this animation shows the uh, a hind cast of a climatological average drivers um, over the, over the uh, North Atlantic. And what you're seeing here are the abundance of the stage five, so that's the C5s, but in the surface, and the adults uh, over, over a yearly cycle, a repeating yearly cycle. So in the winter, there's nothing there. Then, this, then you can see that they, they emerge to the surface and start reproducing along the southern, southern uh, edge of their distribution and build up in high abundances, especially in the uh, Labrador Sea and the, and, and the Norwegian Sea. So the transport here is determined by the Nemo physical forcing. So that gives you the flow and temperature. And in this case, it's a statistical composite of sea whiffs, that's a satellite, um, sea color data and bottle data on chlorophyll to give a, a driving field for the food in which, which they require for growth and egg production. So we can, I mean, that's nice, but we can compare the, 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 with data from various North Atlantic locations and uh, so the, the panel of six figures here are from different sites, the Gulf of Maine in, in the uh, Western Atlantic, the, the Labrador Sea in the Western Atlantic as well, um, not much actual data. So the points are the data, the, are data um, from nets. The dashed line is CPR uh, estimate of, of abundance and the solid line is the Strathcal model output. Well, and the, the other locations, Mar Marchison is, is uh, at the boundary between the Norwegian Sea and uh, the North Sea. Uh, Ocean Weathership India is in the mid-Atlantic south, south of Iceland. Uh, Ocean Weathership Mike is in the uh, Norwegian Sea and Westman Islands is, is Iceland. There's a lot of variability. The data is pretty noisy, um, but 
I th the, the model certainly captures the main shifts in seasonality in the different regions. I think that's uh, fair enough to uh, say that. Now, Strathcall tells us that high ice cover and um, low temperatures tend to cause low calmness from March because productivity. So if we look at the mean abundance with transport from the model, you can see the left hand, top left hand panel there. Um, we switch off transport, then whole regions shut down. So the population is not, not sustainable in those, in those regions. So we can see that the difference, the rightmost panel on the top line, uh, are, are areas that are sustained by transport. Kalanspin Martricus is there, um, but it's, it, it, it wouldn't be there uh, if, it, if it just relied on a closed life cycle within, the, within those regions. And we can see what's causing that from the bottom, the bottom panel. So ice cover in the, in the bottom left panel. Um, so this is the percentage of time that the area is that, that covered by ice along the Greenland uh, ed, edge, there's, there's a lot of ice around Svalbard, et cetera. And the, the, the generation length um, is very long. So that's the middle panel there. So these are cold waters, extremely long generation times. Um, that's for, that if there's not any transport means that the population is unsustainable. And of course, these correspond to the areas that, 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 are, that are in cold water shown by the, the bottom right-hand panel there. But the Arctic's changing, so that's the, that's the current state of affairs. So the, the climate models are predicting changes, big increases in atmospheric CO2 and the, and the resulting changes in the annual temperature shown by the, pan, the, the two panels on the left. And this, the, in the ocean, global ocean model, Nemo Medusa, this pr produces change in the future oceans. So the right-hand panels here show um, uh, outputs from Nemo Medusa model. So that's the, the, that's the Nemo physical model coupled to Medu the Medusa ecosystem model. So the ice, so if we look at the top panels here, we've got 1990, 2040, 2090. So we're looking over the, the, the coming century. You can see that there's a big predicted reduction in, in the percentage ice cover over that time. Sea surface temperature is increasing uh, pretty much everywhere. So that's the middle. Uh, the, the, the set of middle panels and uh, the mean annual food abundance. So this is chlorophyll. In this case, this is a prediction from the ecosystem model. Uh, there, are some, there, are, there are some changes there with increased production, at least in the southern part of, uh, of the, the domain. So we've got a changing Arctic. So in the second of our polls, I'd like you to think, what, what do you think is going to happen to Calanus fin marchicus in a warming Arctic? Is it going to increase in abundance? Is it going to decrease in abundance? Or, meh, it's not going to do very much. So we're thinking here, in the, particularly in the Arctic region, not, not over all of its domain. We'll give everyone just a few more seconds to get their vote in. Okay, so there's, well, no, nobody's thinking it's not going to have an effect, um, but uh, the majority view is that there's going to be an increase in abundance, but quite a few people as well are saying it's, it's going to decrease. Well, what, what's Strathcal going to tell us about this? Well, first, Well, if you said that it was going to increase, 
which was the majority view. You're in good company. There's papers that certainly have predicted this uh, based on probability of occurrence and the effect. So these are statistical models that have temperature included. And so the increase in sea surface temperature over this period is predicting uh, increased occurrence in the, uh, in, in, in the Arctic. And you can see this figure from the, the Rigondo et al. paper 2011 that shows for, diff for, for uh, the changing distribution over, over uh, decades historically and, in, and into the future based on, uh, on these increasing temperatures. But it's not quite as simple as that. So se the semi-empirical modelling uh, that we've done in the Strathclyde group uh, that's uh, illustrated by, by the, 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 the yellow figures on the, on the right hand side there, suggests that the, the picture is a bit more complicated. So if we look in the top left panel there, that gives the change in prosome length. Remember, we know that that's related to temperature uh, over, uh, over, the, um, over the, the, the domain. And we can see that that's, that's uh, predicting quite big reductions in prosome length. So that's what we're expecting from, from um, increased temperatures. And uh, also relevant to how long they can diapause is the change in the diapause temperature. So that's the, 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 the lower of the, the two leftmost panels, which again, well, in this case, this is saying that the temperature is increasing uh, pretty much uh, uh, everywhere for, for diapause. And the result then is the change in diapause duration. So there's a drop pretty much everywhere in the, the change in potential diapause duration. So why is that? Well, it's the surface changes only tell you part of the story. So if we, if we look at different decades here for the, the diapause temperature, we can see that in the Barents Sea in particular, in the two, 2000, 2090, it's predicted that the diapause temperature is very much higher. And that's because this, the sea is, is much shallower than the Norwegian basin. So the, the effect of the, of the increasing temperatures is felt, um, or is, uh, the, the magnitude of, of, the in, of the increase in temperature for the diapausing individuals is much greater in the Barents Sea. So, Let's go back to the question. So model question one, what are the limits to the poleward ex expansion of Calnus marchicus in the Atlantic in the near term? Well, uh, this is quite a complicated figure. I'll take a little bit of, of, of time over it and hopefully it will, it will be clear enough. So the set of the top set of nine panels, uh, or nine, uh, the panel of nine, nine figures labeled changes in the environment just a reminder of some of the things that we've already seen. So the mean ice cover and the maximum ice extent uh, is, is changing over the decades as you move from left to right. So you can see the drop in ice cover uh, and, the, and a pulling back of the maximum ice extent. The mean annual surface temperature is shown in the next three panels down. So again, you can see there's a there's substantial warming pretty much everywhere. And the bottom uh, set, the three of three in under A, is the mean diapause temperature. So again, we can see that that, that the Barents Sea here is is an, a region to watch because this, the the temperature for diapausers is is strongly affected or strongly increases over time. And the effect of these the changes in the environment on the traits of the diapause shown in panel B, so that's the bottom six figures there, again, going decade in, in three decades. And the top three are the generation lengths in days. So they're growing faster, as, mainly as a result of the increase in, increase in temperature. So that's, that's something that you would expect to drive increases in abundance. Um, but then if you look at the potential diapause figure, 
So that's the bottom three figures here. Then there's there's long, we start out with potential long potential diapause that's almost almost a year long, so very long potential diapause. And then this de decreases somewhat in the Norwegian Sea, but then in the top left of each of the figure, that's the Barents Sea region. Uh, we can see that that the um, potential diapause uh, then plummets, so it becomes very low because of the high the high overwintering temperatures in that region. So it's a bit hard to and, and the, the result then. So if we now look in the middle the middle figures, what's this? What's the effect of all this on the on the changes in abundance of Calanus? Well, again, we've got 1990s, 2050s. 2090s, and we're, we're looking at the abundance. So that's the mean annual abundance of C5s and adults in the surface again. It's a bit hard to tell exactly what's going on there. So it's useful, I think, to partition the region into different, uh, or partition the model domain into three different uh, uh, um, regions. So the black lines on the figure mark the boundaries of the regions we're going to talk about. So the, 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 the middle part um, between Norway and Iceland uh, is the Norwegian Sea. This, the bit along the Greenland, uh, the this side of Greenland is the Greenland Sea. And the, the, the bit that's east of Svalbard and to the north of Norway is the Barents Sea. So if we, if we consider what's actually happening uh, by measuring an abundance index. So this is a normalized estimate of the, of the abundance in each of these regions. That's shown in the, in the left, um, the right-hand panel for these different regions. So they all start at one because they're normalized. So this is just showing the relative change in each of the regions. In the Greenland Sea, well, the abundance is going up. Well, it tails off a bit at the end, but basically there's a, there's, there's, there's a big increase. And the Norwegian Sea, which is the southernmost part, uh, there's a decline in abundance. So this is, this is the sort of north-south shift that, that, that we're expecting from the probability of occurrence type models that I mentioned earlier. But the Barents Sea is more interesting because here we see, a, we see an increase in abundance initially and then a catastrophic decline in abundance. So the warming of, in the Barents Sea is actually uh, having two, two, separate, two separate effects. So let's have a, a bit closer look at that. So here is the figure reproduced, but with an, with an additional scenario. So this, the, the dashed lines here are where there is no deep warming. So the, 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 the deep layer temperatures were kept at the, at the historical values and there's only surface warming. And from this experiment, we can see something very interesting. So the, the, the Greenland Sea, that's the, the yellow orangey line. There's not much difference between with deep water warming or no deep water warming. warming. Um, and likewise with the Norwegian Sea. So, what's, so it's the surface that's driving the changes here. So the abundance in, in the Greenland Sea, for example, is because there's, there's, there's more productivity, there's shorter generation times and everything's happening fine and they can diapause in, in cool, deep water. But the Barents Sea, the picture is very, very different. So there's a huge difference, especially in the latter part of the time series between the dashed and the solid line. So that's the black line. And the reason the the reason for this is that the deep water warming, um, the, well, the surface warming is allowing the, the, the population to invade the Barents Sea, but then it's suffering eventually because of the deep water warming and the costs of uh, over, overwintering, meaning that they can't, they can't survive long enough to the next spring. And the bottom panels are, are just uh, the temperature changes that are predicted from different um, an ensemble of different models. So our results are not, and this, the pattern is pretty consistent. The Barents Sea is predicted to be warmer in the deep water um, by, by all the models. 
The other model question, which I want to touch on very briefly here, is what's the magnitude of the effect of the changing spatial distribution on the lipid pump? Well, this is this is still a bit preliminary. But remember, the idea of the lipid pump is, is caricatured by the, the, the picture on the left here. So on the top, we've got what's called the lipid shunt, which is the the, the, the capture of, of lipids from, from phytoplankton by, by calinus, and then the descent into diapause into the deep water is called the lipid pump. And in the deep water, then the, the calinus are respiring and indeed dying there, so not all of them get to come back up to the surface. Um, but this is, this is well below the permanent thermocline, so this carbon does not make its way back to the surface except this except for um, the, 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 the ascending Calinus finmarchicus minus the amount of carbon that they spent staying down there over the winter. And the empirical estimates uh, of this, I say, are very large. The, this, the figure in the bottom left uh, are empirical estimates of the, the lipid pump from the Jonas Dotter uh, et al. paper in 2015, preceding the National Academy of Sciences. And uh, the, 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 the carbon fluxes predicted um, per square meter per year are, are um, of the order of five, five grams of carbon per square meter per year. So very substantial and certain comparable to uh, particulate organic, organic uh, uh, carbon flux. So in Strathcal, remember, we've got this relationship between temperature, birth and prosome length. And the, um, there's, a, there's a relationship between prosome length and the oil sac volume. So the bottom of the middle panels there shows you, shows you that with data. So the points are, 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 are published data. So if we assume then that the, the, the upper bound of that, there's a lot of spread here, but that's because the samples are taken from diaposing individuals, but then, but then some of these have been down for a while and have used up some of their, their lipid reserves and some haven't. But we could assume that the, that the upper bound of this relationship, it, it gives us a relationship between prosome length and oil sac volume. So with the temperature uh, at depth, then we can predict uh, the, the, um, the relationship between the maximum wax ester, that's the lipid, and as a function of prosome length, and we have a lipid levels at, at, at entry into diapause, that's the blue line in the, in the right-hand panel, the right-hand figure, uh, and some of these will be used for, for, for sustaining the animal over, over the diapause period, over the winter, and then they need some residual amount as well for post-diapause molting and uh, reproduction. And our initial work here uh, suggests so this, that, that the magnitude of this lipid pump effect um, is, is comparable to the, to the field estimates. So the, the figure here shows you in grams per meter squared per year, the, the carbon lost in the, in the deep layer through the, the burning up of the lipid reserves and the loss of individuals by mortality. So somewhat more briefly, uh, I, uh, I want to say something about fish. The, the modeling approach is very, very similar. Um, and in this case, we call the model Strath space. And the species that of interest is Benthosema glaciale, which is, which is a mesopelagic fish. So it's, it's, li it's living quite deep, about 400 meters down. Um, and the reason that, that we're interested in this now is that recent global estimates of mesopelagic fish abundance have suggested that they might be an order of magnitude higher than, than previously thought. It's still uncertain whether this is the case. There are, there are technical problems about measuring, measuring abundance, but, but that's, the, that's the, 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 the current thinking is that the abundances are very, very much higher than previously thought. And these are unexploited, so there's it the, the, commercially. So there's interest in, in modeling these the species like benthosema um, in order to see whether they're an exploitable resource or not. 
So our approach here is very similar to the, to the Calinist type model. So it's discrete in space and time, closed life cycle. Um, uh, but the growth is different, of course. So the, the fish species don't have um, the life, the complex life history stages. So you've got eggs, juveniles, uh, and, and adults, but they increase in size according to von Bertel Amphrey growth. So they're continuously growing over, over their, 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 their life cycle. But as, as the, co the metabolic costs increase with size, then these catch up with their ability to feed. In our model, the larvae are planktonic, and this is a very this is these mesopelagic species are typically quite small, so they're maybe five centimeters in length uh, at uh, reaching adulthood. So the the um, they're not active swimmers in the horizontal. So the adults are assumed to be biodiffusive, and we have temperature dependent growth uh, and mortality. Once again, the physical transport is from the the, the Nemo model and the temperatures. So in the animation here, um, this is the, the preliminary results from the Strathspace Benthesema model. You can see that the, the year um, is increasing here. So these are, these are the, the tons per square kilometer uh, averaged over the year for the adults. And we're coming up to 2020, 2021, and now we're into the future. It looks as if there's a, there's a decline, but it's not very clear from, from that animation exactly what's happening. There are certainly shifts in the distribution from year to year um, and, and shifts in, 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 in the overall abundance or changes in the overall abundance. So it's a length structured model. So in this case, we have, we have uh, discrete length classes. And we can model the full length distribution of the population. So the, the, the animation on the left shows you the yearly cycle uh, of the juveniles and adults and the total population, the length distribution. So lengths on the, on the, on the x-axis and the population in millions uh, on the, on the y-axis. So we can see that, that um, in the winter, there's no reproduction. And then in the spring, we get the young individuals coming in and they begin to, to dominate the length distribution. So what's gonna happen in the future for Benthesema according to this, to this model? Well, the right-hand panels show uh, year, the, the yearly abundances of eggs, larvae, juveniles, and in the bottom right, the biomass uh, in, of, of adults. And, in, and we're seeing a strong, and this is a temperature driven effect, uh, decline in the abundance. So when we come to think about the sustainability of harvests, uh, of our potential harvests on this species, that's something of um, extreme importance. So in conclusion then, uh, well, I want to begin with a very large scale, um, big, high level conclusion. That, that's a large scale spatial model, modeling of marine species is a, is, a, is a technically challenging thing. If you, if you did it by classical methods um, solving the associated PDEs and three dimensions and the physiological structure, and et cetera, an enormous job, you wouldn't be able to, um, to do experiments very easily with the models that you would, uh, you would come up with. But the, there are huge computational gains that can be achieved um, by separating the modeling of transport from the modeling of the biology. So the, the results, is, the models I've shown you here run in a matter of seconds per year on an ordinary desktop machine. That's the, 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 the super expensive part of it is calculating the transport matrices in advance, 
But since the biology doesn't affect the transport, there's no reason why you, you can't do that in advance. And it's just a one off thing. But then you can ex you can play around with parameterizing models and doing scenario experiments once you once once you've already done that and the, the, the biological model um, runs rapidly. In, in terms of the results from the Strathcal model, then it performs well in hindcasting spatial distributions and annual cycles of at specific locations. Uh, and we get the magnitude of the lipid, lipid pump uh, effect um, about right, same, certainly same order of magnitude, well, more than an order of magnitude, it's quite close to the, to the, to the estimates of, um, from, from uh, data. The forward projections um, suggest that under under the IPCC R RCP 8.5 scenario, so that's the, that's the, the 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 most extreme warming, the business as usual scenario, that we get an initial range expansion, which corresponds to the earlier um, probability of occurrence models, um, of uh, so get an initial range expansion of the of the of the species, but then a collapse in some regions, particularly the Bering Sea. And the reason for this collapse is that is that it's the deep water warming that's important, but important because it, it shortens the, the 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 potential overwintering distribution. The initial forward results from the, the Strathspace Mendocino also suggest that there's reduced biomass of this important mesopelagic fish in the near future. So, well, there's, there's, there's ongoing work there, but more generally, what, ne what next? Well, the two species that I've focused on here, Calanus, is, well, the, the first one, the zooplankton, is planktonic, of course. And Benthosema is not an active swimmer in the horizontal because it's just a small species. Um, but many species do migrate considerable considerable distances and we're not just talking about salmon here so other mesopelagic species like blue whiting have large feeding migrations from going from Ireland all the way into the Norwegian sea on an annual basis for example and uh, even species they don't think is really strongly migratory um, nonetheless move to to specific spawning locations like cod and so forth so I don't really have any answers here, but I want to throw this the question out there. How can we how can we model that these sorts of species? It's clearly they're, they're important and it's clearly a big challenge. And I think we're short of data as well on what drives movements. So the blue whiting case, well, we think it's, it's there are feeding migrations. But what are they feeding on exactly, and so on? So there, there are there are difficult there, there. There's some pretty big open open questions there, and and I dare say a shortage of data that would allow you to construct more construct models for um, for migratory species. So I just want to finish by um, acknowledgement. So Mike Heath um, has done a lot of work with me over over the years on these different different projects. Um, Emma Dolmayer is a PhD student at Strathclyde, has been working on mesopelagic fish, and uh, Robert Wilson, who was at Strathclyde but is now at the Plymouth Marine Lab, um, has done a lot of the, the, the coalface work on, on, on Calnus finmarchicus. I also want to thank the funders, so the, the, the Calnus work, current Calnus work is, is uh, a part of the Changing Arctic Ocean programme by NERC, and uh, the Benthesema work, uh, is ongoing as part of the um, MISO EU project, so it's Horizon 2020 project, uh, ecologically and economically sustainable mesopelagic fisheries. Um, at the bottom, I've got I've put some links to the websites for those those projects and uh, the and Strathclyde one and and some references. Thank you. Great, right. thank you so much, Douglas, for making a topic that. I think sounded really complicated, uh, actually more accessible and explaining all those graphs that you had included in your presentation. That was really helpful, uh, understanding all the results that you were speaking about. So we've had a good chunk of questions coming in. So if any of our attendees who are with us haven't already submitted a question and you would like to ask something, then please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. 
and we will jump right into the first question from Andrew. So uh, their question is, the temperature based model assumptions are most interesting in the regions where, there, where there's no supporting data. Doesn't this carry a risk for climate change simulations where temperature rises pushes the model into these unsampled right regimes? Well, there, there, of course, there is always a risk, but I think I think because we're the the appeal I think for this sort of modelling is that it's process based. So we, it, it's arising from the predictions are arising from from things that we we that are fitted to data within the with um, uh, within current observations. So we know that the the effect of temperature uh, on the development time. These are these are pretty good estimates. Um, for example, our our thesis, uh, our hypothesis um, about the effect of of um, temperature on on body size. Well, we know that there's an effect of temperature on body size. Um, the argument that it's just body size at birth is a bit more contentious. The way we 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 model that, but. But the key point is that it's the, 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 the predictions are all the result are the results of uh, processes that we that we understand reasonably well. Um, the risk of pushing a model outside its outside current bounds um, is greater if you, if you think about statistical models because that's just that is extrapolation. Whereas because we've, we're we're trying to understand what's going on by process here, that's that's a a, a, a different um, feature. Okay, understood. Thank you. We're actually going to skip over Andrew's second question at the request of him to uh, go into James' question, and we will jump back to Andrew's second question in a moment. Uh, so James's question uh, asks. Estimates on the impact on the lipid pump are all based on the change in distribution on one species. Is it likely that other zooplankton species will also change in distribution and contribute to changes in the overall flux of lipid? Is a multi-species model of value for predicting future changes in the lipid pump? The, the initial work on the lipid pump was done um, on Calnus van March, but there's a subsequent, which I cite there, but there is a... Um, uh, a subsequent paper on Calnus uh, helgolanticus, for example. The, uh, uh, but there are other Arctic species, of course. So, yes, it's the, <laughs> it's the answer to that. So I think ideally one would, would start looking at, at, at these. I don't, I don't know if you need a multi-species model. Well, perhaps if you, if you think that they're in competition, then I guess multi-species models is one um, Thing that would have to be considered yeah good uh, an interesting question yeah. good okay uh so our next question asks do you include any form of zooplankton behavior adaptation to climate change uh well the short the short answer to that is is no um there are there, there's not very much behavior involved in the model other than entry into diapause. Um, so there's, there's just a fixed proportion of individuals at the C5 stage that enter, enter diapause, and that's the best. In the absence of any other you know, bits of biology, that's the best that we can, we can do, and it, and it seems to fit the data, historical data, at any rate, reasonably well. But there isn't any other behavior, really. Um, uh, understood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, we're going to bounce back to Andrew's second question right here. Um, and they say, on the assumption that uh, Nemo and Medusa is likely to be wrong and to varying degrees in physics slash biogeochemistry, do you know whether your climate change zooplankton forecasts are more sensitive to temperature, most likely accurate, or food availability, less likely accurate? Well, the, the, there's, there's certainly, in terms of the temperature effect, I, I attempted to, to to deal with that a little bit in one of the one of the, the figures. So we, we certainly know that the Bernd Sea effect, the Bernd Sea warming at the diapause depth, is pretty robust. So that's that's certainly an effect that's coming um, from from model ensembles, not not just Nemo. 
Nemo Medusa, uh, so the, the, the biological components in the food fields, uh, I suppose that that is much less certain. Um, and uh, looking forward again, I, I, I think ensemble models are, are, are the way to go, but there aren't very many, there's not a lot of options at the moment. <laughs> Understood. Um, we don't have any other questions. Oh, wait, do we have another one right at the bottom? Oh, yes, there's one more from Andrew again, um, saying that from Adrian Martin, watching on YouTube, is another fish likely to move uh, move in when uh, bentho sema declines? Yes, well, the, the tricky questions, because these, these are single species models. <laughs> So they're not really models to, to address that. So you, could, you can certainly imagine a shifting mosaic of, of many species that with uh, overlapping or even non-overlapping distributions that, are, that, 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 that move as, as, the, as, the, uh, well, as the physical drivers change. But then, but then, of course, you also have the possibility that there are more you know, complicated trophic effects um, but so all I can say is that that's out, out with the scope of this of, of this sort of modelling approach. Okay, but, uh, but, it, but it's it's a good a very good a very relevant question. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So um, we do have a point. Uh, oh, Mike Keith actually has popped in a question. Uh, can you say anything about how you would represent harvesting in such models? Yes, uh, so that, that, that's, well, there have been suggestions about harvesting calmness. I'm not sure what, where, where, that, where that is at the moment. Um, but so I guess it's more relevant to the, to the, to the meso project. Well, of course, that's, that is something that we want to do. There, there are options here. The, the problem with, with harvesting in a spatial context, of course, is that you, you uh, you need to. You want a field of um, of fishing mortality rates in space, and normally you don't have that. With benthosema, well, uh, there isn't a harvest on it at the moment, so we can we can we can start to speculate about how that might be. So we can think about uniform fishing mortality in different regions. So protect perhaps protected regions or or uniform fishing mortality over the entire distribution um, and that sort of thing. One could think about um, more sophisticated models where the fishery itself is responding to changes in the abundance predicted by the, by the, the, the fish model. So you, the, a sort of fish, fishing functional response, as it were, where the, 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 the fishing effort moves to areas of high, high abundance or high production. But we're not there yet. Okay. And, and if you're thinking about typically the assessments where, the, where fishing mortality is assessed, then that's over very large regions. So it says nothing about effort. Um, increasingly, you know, there is data um, online and from, from fishery met monitoring you can see distributions of, 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 of fishing effort, but it's difficult to um, attribute it to, to specific fleets. But these are all things that are that are becoming relevant and that these sorts of models um, could be used in, in conjunction with that sort of data. Excellent. Thank you for answering those questions, Douglas. Uh, there is a, a comment uh, in uh, the Q&A saying that in Norway, they model phytoplankton, zooplankton, and three or more species of migrating fish in the Norwegian Sea with a model called uh, Norwecom um, uh, for migrating yeah, fish in the Norwegian Sea. Yes. The, the, the Norway, well, it's a Norwecom end to end. So the Norwecom model is a, a sort of classical um, nu nutrient ecosystem, nutrient-based ecosystem model. Um, that's that's in th in three dimensions. So it's a, it's a bit like the, the base of it is a bit like the the, the Medusa model with the Nemo Medusa, uh, and onto that they bolt 
um, modules which are of individual species. So the, the base, the base Norway coal model has functional groups. So it's not, it's not species based, but the, but the, um, but some species, including there's, there's one in development now of benthosema, that was part part of the meso, the meso program. Um, but they're they're co they're costly to run. So an individual base model over large over large areas, uh, you don't get to do too many runs. Of these things, so they're they're horses for courses. The 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 the, the strath based approach is to produce th things that are fast to run. You can do lots of experiments with it, um, and the 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 Norwecom end to end uh, has uh, allows you to do. Well, it's linked with the whole ecosystem. So yes, you've got a number, you've got a number of species, and I'll see it's got more to say on on behaviour as well, so vertical migration, etc. Um, but it, again, there's not a lot of data to to, to test the model. So you, the model's producing a lot of a lot of detail, but whether it's whether it it, it really makes sense or not is is harder to gauge. Excellent. Thank you, Douglas, for working through those questions and uh, adding in uh, an additional comment to um, that final uh, uh, comment put in by um, uh, about the Norwecom. Uh, that leads me to say uh, thank you very much for being today's mass webinar. We don't have any more questions to work through, but if anyone who is with us wants to have uh, an email conversation with Douglas, then please note down his email address, which is on the screen right now. And you will be able to find a recording of this talk and the Q&A on the MAS website uh, and on the MAS YouTube channel later today. So uh, thank you very much, Douglas. Thank you. For anyone who is still with us, uh, Please note that we have three more webinars left. So uh, on the 23rd of June, so next Wednesday, one on the following Wednesday after that, and then one on the 1st of July, which is actually a Thursday. But we're doing it to kick off Plastic Free July with a talk from Marie Russell from Marine Scotland. Um, if any of these talks interest you, then please check out the Masts uh, webpage. Uh, you'll be able to find them on upcoming events uh, on, the, on the website there, and you'll be able to find up a sign up link there. And we really hope that we can see you again in one of our future webinars. So I hope you enjoyed today and uh, hopefully see you again. <laughs>